Well, hello. Hi there, everybody. Uh, I'm Glenn Fleischman. I'm a type historian, print historian, technology journalist, and collector of uh, random objects from across type history. And uh, I just acquired from Sweden, from a very nice gentleman there who's probably watching this feed later. Hello. Thank you. Uh, a giant box of peanuts flong. And you may ask, if you don't know or you haven't followed the links on this post uh, what Flong is and where this fits into the to comic syndication, why it was needed, why it's so pretty to look at. So um, in this live session, what I want to show to you is I'm going to do the unboxing. I haven't looked at this. I've taken the lid off and just kind of poked at it a little bit. I have not looked at what the Flong is that's inside there, but I want to start with a quick Flong explanation in which we can revisit later. You can ask questions in the live chat and then I will try to answer them as we go. I'm keeping my eye on that as we go. Um, but let's start with this quick history of where a uh, flong fits into the, um, the history of, of type uh, and printing production, um, which again is my area of specialty. Uh, oops, first I have to get a mouse. This is all very exciting to get, uh, to get everything to work all at once. So I'm gonna use my overhead cam and uh, Michael changed slightly, but again, please ask questions as we go. So let's start with how do you, what do you need a flong for? What is a flong? Well, flong is part of the printing technologies, which you need to reproduce something, but you're going to start with a piece of artwork like this. This is original art by my friend, Matt Boers. And uh, this is an original drawn line art. You see, there's no half toning in it. This is all solid line work in any you know, differentiation in tone is in stippling or other kinds of effects. And, and so Matt has heavy areas of black coverage and uh, the rest is white. So you say, how do I go from this to a newspaper page in the days of metal type when you had to be working with relief metal plates in order to print? Well, here's what you do. First, you take a picture of this and create a photo negative. And uh, I've got some, I'll link to this later um, in the notes for this episode. There's some archival footage at uh, at the Internet Archive that's from the Chicago Tribune, how they were creating newspapers in, I think it was the 40s, and it shows this actual stage very, very briefly. But So you take a, a photographic negative using high contrast films, only captures black and white of this original artwork. Then you expose that film under a bright light to a zinc plate. And the zinc plate is photosensitive. It's been treated in such a way that areas that are exposed to light, that is the lines and black parts passing through, uh, harden. And then it gets run through an acid bath. This can still be done today. It's just not as common. And you wind up with a metal plate like this. That's in this case, it could be magnesium or zinc. I think it's uh, zinc. And um, this plate is thus your negative transfer. So you've taken the original art, you've take, made a negative from it, and then uh, expose that onto a zinc plate. The areas that should be inked on a final newspaper page are hardened and the rest is etched away. So if I hold this up to the camera, you can see it's very shiny, right? Originally, I thought this was another printing plate, but in fact, this is an original. I don't know who kept this. Wizard of Id from uh, many years ago. Many, many years ago. Here, I can flip this for just a second and you can see it the, uh, the right reading version of it. So you can see it's the alone haranger strip. Oh, it's hard to hard to do this when you're working left to right. Um, but so this is not how it looks in reality, but I thought this would be useful to see here. Uh, let me switch it back. So this is what reality looks like. And on the back, it's got this piece of a plate thing, micro metal or something, I don't know. And uh, so this is a very hard metal surface. It's not like lead alloy that's used for, um, for printing directly when in letterpress days or on, on uh, newspaper plate, uh, uh, newspaper plates, uh, the lead is a lot softer and it can, has a small melting point. This is extremely hard. So why should it be hard? It's because you're going to take this and under high pressure, make one of these, a flong. So you take this starting metal plate that's been exposed, right? So this is very hard. Under very high pressure, you make a flong and the flong or mat or matrix, mat is short for matrix. Uh, the flong is a perfect mold. And you notice it's right reading, right? You can look at this and you can see this text is the way it appears in uh, in actuality. So it's, um, it's a mold that's gonna create a reverse plate. So what does that reverse plate look like? Well, heck, I have some examples of that. Uh, here's a Doonesbury plate from the 70s. Pull a few of these out. 
And this is softer metal. You can see not so shiny, right? It's a lot less shiny. The back shows how it's been routed. It's actually been essentially carved and made, uh, made smoother. Um, this is bizarrely, oh my gosh, this weighs so much. It weighs pounds. This is a Joe Palooka strip from the 1940s during the war. Uh, and it's, uh, they made it type high, meaning you could print directly off it, which makes no sense. That's not how they were usually done. They would only make a plate about this thick, uh, just a few millimeters thick, and then raise it to the, the height. That's a, a Blondie and Dagwood from the 1960s. So you see I've amassed a, a small collection. People saved these, even though these were used in the printing process, they would have typically been melted down uh, because there was no reason to save them. So what do you do when you get a whole bunch of strips? Well, you stick them together. So you, you take your flong. Your flong looks like this, right? The flongs were sent out by syndicates to newspapers all across the country. The newspapers would take the flong and they would make plates. They would cast individual flat plates then they would put them together into a newspaper page with all the text and everything else that went on a comics page and they would produce something that looks like voila this is a full page of comics with all of the text maybe a little let's see how hard it is to see i'll see if i get the lighting better but so this is an entire page of comics with um you can see other you know columns and so forth that appear on there um, these have all the classic strips on it you've got Henry the Nebs bringing up father, Tilly the Toiler, Thimble Theater starring Popeye. There's some old school Popeye down there. I got it. There we go. There's Dagwood and uh, Mandrake the Magician, Barney Google, uh, right? All of these cartoons. So this is a full page flong. I can't even fit it in screen here. It's so big because newspapers, remember, used to be very large or much smaller now. So that's the page, the entire page laid out with those metal plates. And then what would you do with, this is going to take a moment. Oh my gosh, hold on. What would you do with that? Give me a second. Oh, you'd make, I have to hold this up like this briefly. This is a heavy metal printing plate. You see it's curved. It's reversed because it contacts paper directly. And the back is all routed out. This is how it was cast. I'll show you an image later of how that's done. Oh, I'm going to put it down. It is very heavy. Hold on a second. There we go. Oops, I'm stuck. Stuck under a plate. So that's the process. So now you know what a flong is, where it fits in there. A flong is an intermediate step. It's something that was needed in order to create a uh, uh, to create a newspaper plate, essentially. So you go from from original art to negative to zinc etched plate to flong shipped out to newspapers by the syndicate. Then it's poured into metal, laid up in a page. A flong is made from that. Then that flong is poured as metal, it's cast as metal, and put onto a newspaper press. A lot, a lot's going on there. All right, so now here's the moment you're waiting for. Let me, let's me let open up the uh, material that came. So some of the, what I got was, um, uh, some of the material came. Oh, I should note, so thank you to, um, oh, I don't have his name in front of me. He, uh, this fellow in Sweden, he's the one who uh, uh, sold this uh, wonderful peanuts flong. It's a four, this is also, by the way, a four color separation. You'll see some of these when I open the box too. It's one plate, one flong for each of four colors. This is for a color strip. And I can show you that color, the uh, actual appearance of that color strip later. Uh, so uh, this fellow in Sweden, he found a huge set at a thrift store where the thrift store owner had bought them from an estate sale. We don't know where all this came from. It's just somebody managed to get it in Sweden. Um, Kim Alberg, who is from Sweden, watching this uh, stream, says he would like to see if this, the flong says snubbin rather than peanuts. I think it's all in English. That's the other part. So this one set, I've got a knife. I'm going to cut this very carefully. All right, careful cutting. This is uh, this is a Swedish strip. Uh, here, I'll put an example. I don't know this one. I have to do some research. Let's go back to the overhead cam. And you see, so this... Kim, you can translate this for us, I'm sure. But this is, and it's right reading again, notice, because, um, wait, I can almost read it. It says, a moment, professor, uh, where are you going with that clock? And then I don't know what the last thing says. Then I don't know those words. I don't know those words. Someone's going to see if time will fly, perhaps. That's usually what the joke is. Uh, <laughs> so this is a Swedish strip. There's no information on it. Oh, here we go in the back. I can see the plate was made, or this flong material, which is, arrives as uh just big sheets of essentially a hard paper, wood pulp-like material. This flung material is called Top Star. It was made in Switzerland. Um, but as I go through, I've got a whole stack, and they're all numbered because obviously these are going to run 
uh, different days the syndicate would have provided them. You notice there's six strips on each page. I'm not sure if you can see that. Uh, let's see. So you can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six. And the reason is that's for Monday to, through Friday, right? These are all the daily black and white strips in most newspapers in the past, especially in the metal era. And uh, so, this, so this is going to be fascinating for me to research. I'm going to have to find um, Oftenblage, Oftenblag, whatever the, uh, I'm blanking on the name, the newspaper probably would have appeared in, see if the archives are online and see if I can track down which, uh, which days these appeared in in the past. Um, usually they'll find a, a notice. This strip is by, oh, I'm having a hard time reading it. Um, there's usually a copyright notice. This one does not seem to have a copyright notice or a, um, the artist's or syndic uh, syndicate name. So you can see there's, uh, actually read it better on screen with you there. It says Ingehoffenbrandt, maybe something like that. Um, but no, so you look through this, there's no copyright. Okay, so let's get to the main act, which is I'm gonna pull out this big, let me put these aside carefully. Do not wanna harm the flong. Uh, let's pull out the big selection of peanuts. Oh my gosh, this is so amazing. So here's the, I'm just gonna hold this up so you can see. This is one of two packages of them that we're gonna unpack. I need to move a few pieces of material here so I don't wind up ruining anything in the process. Oh, I can hold up. You want to see a basis of comparison. This is a full newspaper page, as you can see here. And I pull out a ruler just so you get the sense of it. This is, uh, this flong is almost 22 inches. Oh, my goodness, right? 22 inches long, 21 inches long, sorry, 21 inches long by, and it's cut off though on the right. So it's 14, but it would be uh, probably 16 inches wide. This is a standard, see if I get it back far enough, standard newspaper page. So you see compared to my head, a large tet, um, grand tet, a grand tet. Um, and this ruler, <laughs> I don't know if that helps, but you can see this is a very large page because newspapers used to be extremely big. Let's put that aside. And uh, I've got another, oh, got a whole other. So if you notice, there's a color difference here. I'm thinking uh, as we go through this, we'll find out. I think the pink ones, as opposed to the gray ones, the pink ones may be the separate color separations for Sunday strips. So let's switch back to the overhead camera. Uh, oh, Tony, yeah, so Tony asks, how, I know about how these were packaged or shipped originally. You know, this is actually, uh, let me do a little more unboxing and then I will show you a thing. If you look in the notes for this podcast, or this podcast, I do a lot of podcasting, not so much live casting. If you look in the notes for this video, I have a link to a popular mechanics article from 1926 that purports to show how comics are syndicated. The problem is the photos are a little out of order, but I'll show that. I'll actually do it as a uh, show the PDF here in just a moment, and it shows them actually packaging these up. And I'll, I'll show you a Doonesbury flong for a week that uh, is from the 1970s. That's very special. I'll show you that in just a moment, and that'll show how it's packaged too. So I will come back to that. Uh, let's look at the overhead camera again. So let's see. Here's this big big exciting package i've seen a little bit of this because the fellow who sold these to me did send me some images of course before i made a purchase but yeah so here are you can see this is the red plate i don't know if you can read the word red i'll, I'll pull it up closer the camera may even be the easiest thing see where it says peanuts 74 red so that's the july 4th obviously red there's some marks around the side for registration and so forth um and uh so there's four plates for every strip um these don't all correspond. I'm actually have to match, mix and match these. These come together. One, two, yeah. Okay, so here are four. I can show you these in sequence for this. So here's, sorry about that loud sound. Here's the black plate, the key plate, or, or, so it's CMYK, right? It's uh, cyan, yellow, magenta, black are the printing colors. And in the comics industry, they seem to, or the newspaper comics, they seem to talk about uh, red, yellow, um, blue, I think they say, and black. And here the black plate isn't even labeled, but you can see all the text is on it. So this is what's happening. Charlie Brown, what are you up to? Oh, the weather's been bad lately. And then uh, Linus quotes the Bible to him for uh, four uh, panels. And then Charlie Brown says, how would it be if I just yelled at the um umpire? Uh, so this is labeled in the corner, Stockholm, July 18th. Now, you know, there were a lot of, of English language newspapers around the world. And my suspicion is that these were sent off to an English language newspaper printed in uh, Sweden. And so I'll have to do some research to see if I can match that up. So this is, you see, it's the good news there is they wrote, someone actually wrote, 
718 on it so I can because uh, there's no um, well I shouldn't say that actually if I look at it carefully so there's the copyright notice so I can tell what year so this is 1978 that says and it says there's also a date because Charles Schultz always wrote the dates in there so that says 718 on there so I know this is July 18 1978 so I can go back and look these strips up so that's the black plate Here's the plate that's marked blue. And you see what's funny is they wrote it. It's actually written on the plate. And you think, well, isn't that going to reproduce? It's no, they would actually just fill that part in. So when they made a plate from this to go to lay out on the page in order to make the flong, in order to make the newspaper plate, they would fill that part in uh, and do other work to clean up the original. Here's a good, this plate is the red plate, but here's something neat. You can see, you know, this is, this is a half tone reproduction. So it wasn't like you had to do line art to reproduce uh, to reproduce images in flong. Um, so a lot of it's line, but when you're dealing with color, obviously you want tint. And I don't know if you can see, I'm trying to get this angled so you can see the halftone pattern. So uh, line art was very common for daily black and white because it reproduced best. But color, they would be using, well, it wasn't rotogravure, it was still uh, relief plates for um, comic pages, but they would want to get tints. So there's our red plate. And there's our yellow plate. And so you can see which colors were separated for each of those things. And then, you know, together, these are all made into individual, very large flongs, or uh, what are called stereotypes, rather, the metal plate from it. Then they'd be pasted up, uh, or not pasted up, I'm sorry, they'd be laid out as a giant metal page and then made into a full newspaper page. Uh, so that's one, that's just one strip. Let's see what else we have here. Oh, a lot of these, I think there are some daily strips in here too. Oh no, are these all four color? Interesting. So these may all be Sunday strips, which is very exciting. Let's see. Yeah, here's another, please send junk food. These are all from the same period of time, I think. These all look like from the same era. Okay, I'll just go through a few more of them. You can see the plates. Here's Snoopy. Some of these have a little water damage, but um, generally looking pretty good. Yeah, this is 1978. It looks like this may be a sequence. So one thing that I've, I love this texture. You can probably see that. Let's get it a little better so you can see. Uh, I'll go up in there. Yeah, so you can see there's this fun kind of texture when you're printing across multiple colors. And this again being the blue or cyan plate. Um, and just that half toning to get the color thing you can imagine. Um, I have a printed page if you just want to see what this obviously should look like in reality. Um, this is the, pre I'm going to switch to the front camera because it'll probably be easier for a moment to see it. So this is that strip that I showed earlier, the one that I bought last year. Um, that's uh, this one from the same fella. Thank you again. Uh, that's the black plate. And then I searched around to see if I could find a printed paper from that era. And this is the San Francisco Chronicle. The printing is horrible. Here, I'll put it under the other camera. You can see it's actually one of those things where you're like, sure, the printers have been embarrassed about this thing. This was late stage metal print, uh, metal era printing, but you just, everything is out of registration. Look at, um, oh gosh, where's the, there's just so many bad colors. Look at Lucy being all blotched with blue everywhere. Charlie Brown looks like he has a fever. Um, the registration is incredibly bad. Uh, I have an image that I can't share because it's under copyright. I don't have a physical object from a different paper of that era from a different newspaper printing the same strip and it's perfection. So this is an issue of, um, this is an issue of reproduction, right? It's not a issue with the flaw. I'd love to get a copy showing the same strip that is in perfect condition. So you can see the difference. Uh, oh, some questions. Let me answer some questions before I keep going on about the, uh, we'll show some more flong here in a minute. Uh, so I know um, Tony had asked about, uh, we've got a question here from, from uh, David as well. Let me show you, I'm going to do that first. Um, I'll switch to a presentation here. One second while I get that selected. So this is popular mechanics from uh, 1926 and how cartoons are syndicated, right? And uh, it shows, uh, oh, I should just ask you, everyone can see that, right? You can see that on screen. I have to, um, this is all a little new to me, so I have to make sure that we can actually see the thing I'm trying to show you. And uh, well, so this popular science uh, article uh, sh traces Gasoline Alley with Skeezix, you know, the foundling who uh, was part of the strip at the time and so forth. And uh, it's, um, it's, a great, uh, it's a great example. Oh yeah, we all can see it, okay. <coughs> Excuse me. 
so it's a great example of um, you know reporting except it shows a lot of great stuff there's the original strip um, and again you can find this in Google so you can uh, you can uh, read the article yourself there. I'm just going to scan through it. This shows the flong being made, which is useful. So there's that full plate, as I was talking about. They run it through at the top is where there's the machine. This is one kind of machine that puts pressure against it to create the negative plate there, that, uh, that sort of the negative flong, that paper mold. Then you can see here's how they were pour a full plate. In this case, a flat newspaper plate. Usually newspaper plates are curved, so they go in a rotary press. But you see there's the flong. Uh, and they're pouring this massive metal, oh my God, you know, huge bin of uh, super heavy lead alloy in there. Um, so again, the photos go a little out of order because here we're seeing him actually draw again and so forth. And it's later, I can answer the Tony question is, so this is uh, someone looking at stacks of mats. This is a worker who's looking at all the mats that were produced, like those stack of peanuts mats and uh, checking them for quality. And then somebody puts them in cardboard, usually these huge size things, right? We usually don't mail stuff that's that large. It could be sent by train uh, or by the postal mail and sent flat out to all the newspapers who subscribe. So that's how that part of the distribution uh, worked. Um, the uh, David asked about the slashed X's and other marks in the background. Let me find one that has that i've got to be careful to not get things out of order because um, some of these plates are all together and i've got to although they're all again they have dates so that's a useful thing this oh here's something super fun this is obviously there must be ice skating going on here because here i'll put it under the, the better camera because uh it just cracks me up because you can see the marks um of uh it looks like ice rink marks there what's going on what's going on there charlie brown um let me see if i can find the black plate Oh, I can't find the black plate for that. So I don't know what's happening, but it looks like somebody is spinning all over the place. Uh, it's really cute. So the X's, let me find one with those. Oh, here we go. So this is a good one. That's a different colored one. Obviously the same kind of material. It's again, a four color. It's very large format, four color. And you can see these X's and marks. Now I would love to know the story behind them. I assume it's that you don't want something too smooth there so that um, lead doesn't flow freely. So these may be like lead traps or something when it's being poured uh, to provide some restriction. Because uh, let's see, in this case, that's all raised area. So that's all going to be printed red. Because you see anything that's, so let's think about this, right? Anything that's debossed, let's see if I hold it at an angle. Anything that's below the surface will have lead fill it in. So this is all red that's going to appear there. Same thing, you look at this. This one is the blue plate, a lot of those X's as asked about, and uh, all of that lower surface, that's all going to be uh, filled with lead to make blue. Now it's interesting there's X's again, I'm wondering that might be part of the process. That's a really great question. Um, because it's debossed, you would think that they would want that to be as smooth as possible, but it's possible that it produces I wonder if that's an unusual case. So we may have a mystery here. This is a great thing. I'm always looking at originals. One reason I want original material is I want to be able to solve things, right? I want to know what's going on so I can sort them out. Um, here's some more daily strips that are mixed in here. Oh, so here's a strip I don't know. It's not labeled. It says Moco on it. Uh, I think it's three. It looks like three different strips. Uh, there's no dialogue. It's one of these international strips, I think, that they were created so they could run them across countries to um without uh having to translate the uh, language in them which is which is handy as a syndicate you can do that um looks vaguely like somebody <laughs> it's so funny somebody's good with children uh oh i see no those are three strips but they're all just kind of joke strips uh let's see what else is in i've got a whole other pile to go through here let's just see if there's anything else that's particularly exciting um, you know, I love this era. This is when I was growing up. So this era, I read some of these strips when I was a kid. So they're familiar to me uh, just from, you know, being alive at that point in time. Uh, let's see. I'll just go see if there's anything else that's of particular interest. You know, you got to love this is you also going to see a lot of the artistry of Charles Schultz because it separates out these elements. And of course, he drew these, you know, he, he inked these or worked with inkers to create these in four color using a special process a to pick very specific ink colors to um oh hey tony has a great idea you know what well gosh no i don't know about that tony wonders if x means don't fill 
And I'm really curious about that because it would have been very difficult since they're large areas. It would be hard for them to mask off, but that may be, boy, well, this is great. This is a great mystery. I'm going to solve it and you'll find it in future rating. Hey, and just by the way, go to glenn.fun. That's G-L-E-N-N dot fun for real. This is how you find me because I wanted an easy to say URL. Uh, and you can find other writing I'm doing and, and other work. So when I find the answer, I'll put it up there. Um, well, here's a good example. So here's another uh, flung. Uh, this is the uh, blue plate. And see, there's only some marks in that one area, but in none of the other areas, oh, those all have, oh, those have a slight amount of color. So I wonder if the X's marks would indicate that solid black, because if we look, you can see a little moire there. Those all have a slight tint behind them. Uh, but again, this is one of the things, you know, I don't like to study stuff that's that's not interesting to look at. So if this were all just boring production material, I don't I don't know if I have this much excitement about, say, um, oh, I don't know, industrial equipment manuals. There's some great history you can derive from them. And there's industrial historians and there's other things you can derive. But I don't know if I'd be as excited to own huge sets of it uh, or photograph it and so forth. But, you know, this is, I love Charles Schultz. He had such a long and wonderful career, and you get to see his work in different ways at a not closer level, but it's, you know, it's not the newsprint reproduction. It's not the clean production of a printed book of Schultz. It's not the, um, you know, the modern production. You go online and everything is, of course, um, scanned. Well, actually, I think they're recreated from the original. You see a four-color work, a uh, four-color Sunday strip of um, Peanuts Online. It is not, of course, going to be uh, the... Um, uh, a scan of a printed item. It's actually like a reproduced uh, four color image. So it's, um, it's not quite the same thing. This is gets us back to kind of the original to that source material that I love so much. Uh, I am just trying to work out here. Let's see. Um, see what else that's if we have anything else that's exciting that I can pull out from this set. Um, you know, I'm always a good fan for Linus doing uh, Og. So let's look at a good Og there. Oh, uh, that's from same year. This is all, wait, that says 1973. Maybe it was 73 earlier when I thought it was 78. Um, so one of the things that I'm thinking is that, uh, is that uh, this newspaper never ran these strips because these are in perfect condition. And I have some uh, flongs that have been used and those show scorch marks on the back. You can see uh, they're sort of falling apart. Most flongs were burned uh, or discarded after they were used because they had no purpose. And um, so I know what it looks like when you have a flong that was used. These are totally impeccable. And by the way, if you want to know, is super wood, super admat. Uh, interestingly, he's talking to a fellow flong aficionado and the wood flongs, the company was named after the people who made the, who founded the company. Their name was wood. So the flongs aren't made of wood. They're made of pulp and other fillers and so forth. Very paper-like substance. Um, but it's, yeah, super ad mat. Um, used for comics and ads. Uh, here's a great wham. Just this lovely, you know, you forget Schultz in later years, I think, was a little more reserved. Um, this is the 70s, pretty much the peak of, uh, it's when you have Spike introduced and so forth. Um, oh my gosh, this is a, oh, if I can find the main plate. This is a Lucy and Charlie Brown pulling the ball away. Uh-oh, where's the, I got to find the, uh, the main plate of it because we have to see where is, where is Lucy pulling the ball away. Poor Charlie Brown, he's waiting to uh, kick that ball and it's never going to happen. Well, I can't find that. We'll have to wait, find out how that mystery gets solved. Let me open another, um, another package. I have a whole other package. Oh, I'll show this too for a moment too since we're talking about syndication. So this is a, I bought this photo off eBay because some images, you kind of have to find the stock, the stock, stock photo. That's a full page ad. And then the flung being uh, pulled off it after it went through the machine. I think it's a particularly good example of seeing both the metal plate all laid out. So that was the plate as they intended to print. And then the flung that was pulled off that was then cast again into a metal plate for printing. Let's open a whole, oh, got one more, oops, one more huge package. I'm going to make all this noise. Look, bubble wrap. I know bubble wrap is very exciting to look at close up. So in one moment, and I will uh, get that out. Just again, trying to not destroy any material as we go. Okay, so let's back up here. Do some, I don't know, is this, it's not um, AMSR or something. We're not going to do that for, uh, let's see, this is a little trickier one. Let me 
again, very carefully with a knife. We do not want to cut any flong before it's time. Well, oops. Uh, okay. Tony also suggests, and I think this is a very reasonable supposition, that the cutouts that aren't needed are included to like those X's to help prevent the flong from warping in transit. It's possible. They're pretty heavy duty and flat. Um, and then they get compressed under the lead, but I still, I think they're, you know, that's the kind of thing where you cut, um, you make uh, slashes through things or you put certain kinds of support stuff in uh, structures in uh, that uh, allows something to lay flat or prevents curling. And so I think it's a very reasonable supposition. Again, it's a great mystery. I love mysteries. Um, here's, uh, oh, here's Linus learning how to uh, bring that up on the other camera. Here's Linus learning how to kick a football. Sorry, the lighting is a little bit, got so many light sources. I beg your pardon. There we go. Bonk. Poor Linus. What happened? Oh no, Sally. I'm sorry. Sally got hit with the ball. That's not so. That's terrible. Terrible thing. Uh, let's see. So this is another great stack. These are all, again, uh, four color over oh, some lovely. Look at that. Look at that. Isn't that wonderful? Woodstock getting covered in snow. This is the, uh, which plate is this? So you can see those would all be reproduced. Uh, oh, this is the black plate. I'm sorry. So those are all the black snowflakes falling to show. And then all this field of, this field of, uh, field of empty color here because, uh, yeah, you know, Tony, I'm starting to think you're right. I think this may have been areas that they filled in because on this page, the rest of it wouldn't have been printed all red. That is almost certainly it. So it may have marked an area you're supposed to fill. I don't know how they would have done that though. Yeah, because look at that. So this is Tony. I think you've solved the mystery for me already. Thank you very much. Uh, so if you look at this, let me get lighting better here. Second one moment. Hold that one out. So um, gosh, I love solving mysteries in real time with people who are observant. Thank you. Let's see. So if we look at this and uh, let's see, and I've got the previous. So there's the four colors for that particular strip so that's going to be reproduced all in black all those snowflakes falling this whole area obviously is not going to be red that's the red plate so all the x's are don't do color nope you solved it tony mystery and then there's these there's half tones everywhere that are solid areas there so those will be reproduced uh to to reproduce um blue a little bit of blue background and then those X's, obviously, there we go. Yeah, and the same thing here. You need some wood stocks here and there and everywhere in yellow, because wood stocks, obviously, solid yellow. And the other areas don't need any color at all. All right, mystery, thank you. This is great. Um, let's see, some more good wood, wood stock talking. It was always a great device, I thought, like the parents. Um, if, you're a, if you're a real peanuts aficionado, you know the parents did speak once, I think, in the 1950s or 60s. There's an offstage word balloon from one parent, and that is, I believe, the only time the parents ever spoke. Um, well, if there's any other questions, please ask them, um, kind of like this, <laughs> peanuts, just onto Stoopy's head, it's not going to print, so that's where they put it, peanuts. Um, I assume, you know, in that era, there would have been a lot of techniques that the people in the stereotype department, it was called, how they would have... Uh, all the things that they would have done to fill in areas. And I'll show you something in a minute that's from a, the Doonesbury flung that I've been holding out on you for. Um, that's very exciting to me. Uh, let's see, I think I've missed, oh, here's, so we've got another question from Tony here. Any sense how deeply familiar the artists were with these processes? Obviously, Schultz must have understood it well enough. Any examples of the artists talking through it all? To my understanding, the artist had uh, no idea about this at all. It just was like a whole other... Uh, thing to them because all they had to do was meet the spec. So you can read accounts, uh, including I thought I saw an interview with, uh, with Charles Schultz about this once or mentioning it, but you can read accounts of cartoonists talking about how they had to specify the colors in particular ways for Sunday strips. They couldn't just draw on every color. They would use transparencies and other material. Uh, at some point, I think they just started using color separations, um, but you can find those discussions. And there was the things called Bende dots that were used uh, in the old days, I think yeah, before photographic processes, maybe even before, I mean, they were used with uh, metal printing, but it was a way to get very specific patterns that would reproduce uh, in a consistent fashion um, without having to uh, create tone. So there were tonal and other patterns uh, that could be uh, transferred 
so that uh, very uh, common in comic books, but uh, look up Ben Daydot so you can find out about that. Um, I communicated with Jerry, uh, Gary Trudeau about these Trudeau strips I'm about to show you uh, for an article that has not come out yet, unfortunately. Uh, that is, um, uh, and I said, have you ever seen stereotypes, the flongs, you ever know about any of that thing? And he was working, you know, he started in the uh, late 60s at the Yale newspaper and then quickly went into syndication, I think it was 71 maybe or even earlier. So he's been, you know, in operation across three major eras. Uh, the uh, the, the uh, metal type era, that stretches back, you know, obviously into the 1800s, but the kind of reproduction used for comics, uh, this flong method was really uh, became popular uh, towards the end of the 1800s, early 1900s, where they developed this wood style or wood, the wood flong from the wood flong family, the wood family, uh, or these kind of uh, wood pulp uh, hard mats, dry flongs, they were called. Before that, the process involved wet flongs, and very messy and difficult to make. Uh, so these dry flong method made comic syndication. Uh, and that's my thesis. Working on it to uh, write something very long about this. Uh, comic syndication, other syndication was made possible through dry flong because you could make one plate like this. Uh, the king is a fink. Of course, the king is a fink. Who who wouldn't want a uh, Wizard of Id plate in which somebody's yelling, "The king is a fink"? I, I got to tell you, nobody. That's the best one. Um, so, you know, when you can make a plate like this, which you could in the 1800s, and then press dry flong against it and create a flong like this with all the tint and tone and everything that could go through it, well, then you have the key to syndication. And uh, uh, so Trudeau was working in that era, right, uh, that had been going on for decades and decades. Then we moved into the more photographic uh, the offset printing era as newspapers shifted in the 70s and 80s wholesale into offset printing, which involves no relief. It's a, just a flat plate in which areas attract or reject ink or water. And then you're using photostats, um, you know, a, a totally photographic flat process. There's no etching anymore. And then into the computer era in which everything's being produced, uh, done digitally, they're being um, uh, uh, scanned or done directly on a computer as the original artwork. It's being passed and sent electronically through all the stages. And then it's being output as plate material. That is the, there actually is a machine. Um, there's some great pictures I found online of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, someone who went in and took photos of a printing plant a number of years ago. Um, the New York Times has an article about how their printing plant runs. I, th I think it went up even during pandemic. Someone had taken the photos ahead of time. And uh, so digital files are output onto uh, the, uh, piece of solid metal aluminum it's flexible plate that gets wrapped around uh, the rollers on a plate for printing um, this uh, aluminum has the same kind of thing as this uh, piece of zinc it's got photosensitive uh, material on it and lasers selectively harden areas that should uh, uh, attract or reject ink and uh, then it's goes straight from this machine right onto press and right onto a uh, paper um, offset the plate rolls onto uh, uh, a, um, the plate is inked and it's rolled onto a blanket, a rubber blanket that then accepts the um, ink from that plate. That's the offset part. And then the blanket rolls onto paper. That's it's two steps removed. That's how you can get away with a flat material instead of a relief one. An offset plate is not printed directly onto paper, but through an offset, one stage offset. So Trudeau lived through these three eras and he had never had any experience with any of the printing production methods. Now I'm going to show you that. Uh, let me put away some. Oh my gosh! So thank you for the peanut. Looking through this peanuts flong with me, I'll have a long time going through that. This um, collecting and photographing. This figuring out the right way to do that. But let me show you. This will finish up with. Uh, again, this is probably the prize in my collection. I'm going to take it out carefully from the. Uh, see, it's careful plastic layer here. But I'm going to show you a couple interesting things about it. Um, Meantime, I'll ask, uh, oh yeah, Tony asks if the Windsor McKay stuff, were, uh, the earlier color comics, were they flongs or pre-syndication? I'm still running that down a little bit. I can tell that um, newspapers would have used flongs in-house, but it's unclear. Uh, they were using in flongs from maybe the 1850s or 60s because it was the only way to, um, there were all these hilarious experiments in trying to print with type, like screwed into um, rotating cylinders and the type would fly everywhere. So once it was possible to, um, and you need a rotary press because rotary press can feed paper through in a roll and go extremely fast. So 
you, in order to print a lot of newspapers and larger sections of newspapers, you need a fast press. To print a fast press, you need a way to have plates that can be cylindrical. To have plates that are cylindrical, you need flongs because you need to cast a metal plate that's full of type and other elements. You need to make that into a solid piece that's not going to fly apart. So I have this contention that flongs and stereotypes, the metal plates, are actually the reason that newspapers were able to, to match um, presses, newspaper presses, improved in their performance and speed long before the methods that you could typeset and produce pages improved. So you had the linotype come in the 1880s, so relatively late. You had flongs arrive before that, and then at some point they all kind of meshed up there, and you go through this massive expansion in print runs, numbers of newspapers, and sizes of editions uh, after the linotype. Because the linotype, the flong, the rotary press all together make for the ability to produce extremely affordable um, high volumes of material. So... Windsor McKay, I don't really know. I mean, you can find he did original watercolors and things, and they would have had to do uh, color photography of that in separation. I don't think he was painting onto transparencies. And I, I, you know, did, were those comics only in one newspaper? My recollection is some comics were, that syndication arose in like the 1910s. And um, I'm still, I'm tracking down some recent history where I found uh, some material that appears to indicate that, uh, syndication predates when I thought, um, but it was still using flongs and metal plates. They would actually send out, they would, they would uh, cast the plates in house instead of sending out flong. And then they would send out sets of metal plates for the printer with the newspaper to put together themselves. And then they would say, when you've run out of these, send the plates back and we'll send you more, which is kind of a hilarious system. Um, I found some comics that looked like they were created over about six months in the 1910s, in the 1910s, and then were reproduced in newspapers uh, starting from about the 1920s or 30s, for the next 40 years, these same very bland, um, almost looks like clip art, bad joke, no joke things with no, there's an artist name, there's no date, there's no copyright notice, and you can find them in weekly papers or papers that didn't come out every day. And these are like filler jokes that they put in. Um, so I'm still trying to track it down. So Windsor McKay, uh, love to know. Okay, so let me show you. This is, say, the piece de resistance of my collection. The... Uh, Capstone. So this is a Doonesbury strip. I'm going to use this camera because it's a little bit better to see. So as you can see, it says at the top, May 7th, 1973. You'll also notice, if you can read closely enough, there we go, Hartford Current. Oh, that's good. That's nice and focused there. So these, these strips, see there's one, two, three, four, five, six of them, right? And at the bottom, it is stamped. It says, as you can see, whoops, I got it really close. Universal Press Syndicate. It's got the week that's supposed to go out and uh, their address and so forth, right? So what is this? This is an uncut sheet of flong that was sent to the Hartford Current. So why is it important? Well, think about the week of May 7th, 1973. If you were, I was born before that. I was not old enough to know all the things that are happening in history at that time. But uh, let's go to the close-up camera and I'll show you here. The, uh, the thing that makes these particularly interesting is that a couple of these strips never ran because John Ehrlichman, uh, one of Nixon was Nixon's chief of staff. Now I wish I remember that right on hand. Uh, he resigned, and some of the strips were referenced. This whole week was about Ehrlichman, and so suddenly this, these Ehrlichman strips don't make any sense because he's not in there. So Trudeau at that time was doing his strips four or five weeks in advance, and uh, after this point he was not. He was doing them delivering as little as a week ahead of time, and the syndicate would have had you think about this whole process of producing. Uh, flongs and getting them out well they had to produce his awfully fast um, but his were topical you know and it was they sold newspapers a syndicate and trudeau made a lot of money off them so they did it but um this is not the famous guilty 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 strip but it's there's another mark um i'm blanking at mark's last name that number again and it's uh trying to get people to call in here's mark at the radio station maybe it'll come to me um but so a couple so there's of these strips if you go and look at the archives you can find that uh, four, sorry, three or four of them ran in essentially or similar format. Uh, I think two, let's say two never ran, and one has nothing to do with Ehrlichman. It was the Saturday strip. So the weekday strips, Monday through Friday. Um, oh, I said earlier, by the way, the six, there's <laughs> the strip of six from Sweden. Of course, that's Monday through Saturday. Those were the black and white days for most newspapers. Um, some modern newspapers also do uh, color on other days of the week, obviously, do them on 
uh, I don't know if anyone's still doing that. Maybe in some other countries, there's color um, for the comics and other days. And so that, that was very rare for an enormous period of time. Comics were always black and white, except for these Sunday editions. The Sunday editions would be done. Sometimes the comics were printed a week ahead of time or even more because they could repair those and put those sections aside between printing uh, the more pressing, you know, multiple editions of a newspaper a day. So um, this strip, this is what's interesting is this went to the Hartford Current uh, it was supposed to run the week of May 7th, 1973. It did not. Somebody there thought, hey, this must be important. And they stowed it away and kept it for almost 50 years and then put it up on eBay. And uh, I noticed it and purchased it. And I'm very delighted. Um, so issue about how Flong was used, um, this felting material, I'm going to hold it up really close over here. Yeah. Okay. This camera will focus nice and close. Ooh, there we go. Uh, this was used to, to hold up when you got flung, they would, uh, the press people would have to build it up. Here, I'll switch to the other camera. You can see more of it there too. Uh, because so on the front side, you'd see there's an area, a large area here that is not debossed. It's actually level with the rest of it. So that, um, not being debossed, it could sink in when the mold was being made because there's nothing behind it. So then you'd get these blotchy areas. So the corresponding area here is this felting on the back. You can feel it. It's felt like, and it uh, it's used to raise up those, those areas um, and prevent that precise thing. Um, so I think I've gone through all the examples of things up here. We've done the unboxing. You've seen the, uh, you've seen the giant metal plate that was used for printing. And um, uh, we've talked about a lot of flung things. Anybody else have any questions? I can take some more before we go here, but really appreciate people tuning into, I know, the most exciting thing in the world, live, flung, flung, flung. It's very exciting, but, you know, those of you turned in, you know, you know who you are. We all like this sort of stuff. Um, I find the whole thing, you know, uh, one of the reasons I study this and I find it fascinating is because I feel like it reveals a lot of aspects about, I don't know, like... Uh, limits to creativity, production process, um, how things were made. Um, it helps me give more insight into the spread of syndication. I'm particularly interested right now in comic syndication because um, I, I think I may write a book, at least a long article, about syndication um, over different eras of time. So before flongs made this possible, or plates even, easy production of, of plates, uh, there's something called ready prints. I only found out about these a few months ago and I've been doing some research, ready prints were essentially pre-printed sections. Now, that that's also sounds like a modern idea. You know, you get things like, I don't I mean, there's things you get in the paper. If you still subscribe to a Sunday paper, they were clearly printed somewhere else um, and they're dropped in, right? This is the same kind of thing as a newspaper or a, a syndicate would produce some kind of special section called a ready print. And they would sell it to newspapers across the country. And it could be like a couple sheets they would bind in, could be entire sections. They could even cust customize it with some uh, advance notice from a given newspaper. And so ready prints were something I, I'm trying to think. I think I saw them back as far as the 1880s, and I'm trying to dig that up. But so some of those things included like uh, newspaper columns and art and illustration. You know, comics, of course, is a modern thing. Uh, Dave Malky, who does the ca cartoon strip uh, Wondermark, is kind of a historian of the late 1800s uh, because that's where he mines the material that he uses to combine it to his strip. And he said, you know, what's happened clearly is that you ha you can see him talking about this. I'm sorry, I'm quoting from the movie Stripped that was uh, created by uh, uh, my friend Dave Kellett and Fred Schroeder. Um, they uh, made a great movie several years ago about the history of cartooning. And it doesn't get into print production, but Malky note, David Malky notes that um, the all these uh, fine illustrators of the late 1800s um, doing wood engraving, that produced this huge outflow of graphic material. Uh, there were entire newspapers that were just full, uh, like weekly newspapers, the, the, the graphic, I think it was called London. There was another like London Weekly Illustrated, Harper's in America, Harper's Weekly. These um, newspapers and uh, publications would um, have people working constantly, these fine wood engravers producing massive, sometimes, you know, showing that newspaper page that's so enormous. Pull that out. Yeah, so this is how big that is, right? So people would be producing woodblock engravings that were this size or two full, two full pages of that, right? And um, all those wood engravers, well, what happened to them when 
uh, half toning was developed, photography and then half toning. So you get into the 1870s, 1880s, and these people who'd made a career for decades doing wood engraving and helping drive the market for newspapers and weekly newspaper, weekly publications. Uh, David Malky says they all, they didn't all become cartoonists, but they had all the skills necessary to shift into illustration and uh, cartooning. And that's when you see this big, the start of cartooning and then the explosion because it was used to sell newspapers. So I'm sort of fascinated. You have this period where cartooning, illustration and cartoons rise. You have the ready prints. Then there's some era I don't fully understand where syndication started happening, maybe with the metal plates only, not flongs. Then you get the hard uh, dry flong method. And that's, you know, all the examples I have, I don't think I have anything that's from before the 1920s in my collection of newspapers and other things. And all the flongs I have are much later. I mean, this Joe Palooka, I'm going to pick it up again. It's going to hurt me. Hold on. Oh, hold on. Lead weighs a lot. Lead alloy weighs a lot. So this plate, it's going to see how thick that is. It's so, here, I'm going to, I've got a scale here we can look at it on. So this is a, oops, you can see it's eight inches. Oops, hold it up. It's eight inches wide. This is the size of a comic strip in those days, right? It's eight inches wide. Um, and how thick is it? It is, well, it's 0.918 inches, which is the height that type needed to print or any kind of object on a press. Um, so this herking plate is from the 1940s. But, you know, I know that you can find examples in newspapers where they would publish things that say like, the mats didn't arrive, sorry, in place of a newspaper. Now the customer, I don't think knew what mats meant, but it meant that like the train load of for USPS mail or whatever didn't arrive with the mats they needed to print that week's comics or that day's comics. So uh, uh, the uh, there's that era I'm trying to sort out. But so then once you get into the period where I'm starting to find things I can, you know, that you can collect that people have kept there's examples of both uh, stereotypes. I haven't found too many older flongs of comics. We know how that like 60 or 70 year period works. Then you get into photostats. Interestingly, hard time finding photostats of comics, which would have been sent out by syndicates. <clears throat> Instead of sending uh, sheets of flong, they would send sheets of photostats that were used for reproduction. Same thing, package them up, send them out. Photographic process, just no metal or etching involved. Um, and then, of course, once you get past that into the era of sending a file or a disk, whatever, there's no trace that I can find of that material, even though it must exist. Um, I don't, I can't find floppies of Doonesbury anywhere. So um, anyway, that's kind of the history of things. Uh, oh, Tony was asking again, sounds a lot like the origin story of William Blake in an earlier era with etching. And it's true, like every time people develop new techniques of illustration or new kinds of illustration, um, you know, there's a, often a commercial aspect to it. And um, the reason there was a rise of wood engraving in the 1800s is people, uh, some artists discovered new techniques. I mean, first you get lithography is invented at the turn of the 19th century, which is an incredible thing, almost by accident. <clears throat> so you have a new method of, of drawing onto a stone to make these rich, beautiful prints, right? So that's one thing that becomes huge. It's totally new, but the techniques, existing artists knew how to use it. Then you get people rediscover... Um, uh, end, grave, end grain carving. Uh, so they're carving wood with very, like, almost like they're doing etching. So etching was all in metal. That was like a multi-century process for producing fine work, but then prepared wood in the right way. You could create these massive illustrations and produce beautiful work with extremely fine detail. And so you'd have artists who would draw, some of them would also do the wood engraving. Others would hand it off to engravers. You'd have teams of engravers executing designs producing thousands of illustrations worldwide a week, maybe tens of thousands on that scale. Um, then you have the halftone events, right? And those people have to go away You have the, because there's not a demand for it. It's a very expensive thing to do wood engraving and reproduce it. So suddenly the halftone takes over, photography takes over, people reinvent themselves. So just like web comics, the, the web cartoonists of the 2000s and modern era are you know recapitulating the same story that has uh, occurred uh, time and time again for cartoonists and for all visual uh, artists, all graphic artists. And uh, again, I'd recommend the movie Stripped. It's available on all kinds of streaming and uh, downloadable platforms, uh, uh, download to buy uh, platforms. Uh, and it's a great, uh, it's got a great Bill Watterson cover and it explains kind of a, I mean, I'd love to make a much, it's going to be a little bit more dry <laughs> version of that movie because it's a little more on the production side, but I'm working on, I'm actually working on a a video that'll explain this whole process with um, a stock. There's there's a historic footage I mentioned. There's like that pop, uh, popular mechanics article, the artifacts I have that I can photograph and put in place, and kind of show the entire process from end to end and why it was such a big deal, how it was done at a mechanical industrial scale. Uh, well, I think everybody may be exhausted. We're almost up here at an hour. Appreciate everybody 
for tuning in live. And if you're watching later, hello, thank you for, uh, thank you for coming. If you'd like to know more about this kind of stuff, well, I have a lot of resources for you. If you search on Flong, F-L-O-N-G on Google, you will find many things I've written and many articles I have, or many photographs I have taken. Uh, if you go to my Flickr account, it's Flickr is, I'm Glenn F, G-L-E-N-N-F at Flickr. I've got albums uh, of pictures of flongs. I'm going to be adding, as I take photos of these new peanuts and Swedish cartoon flongs, I'm going to be adding those to uh, my Flickr collection because it's a great way to distribute it and license material under Creative Commons. Uh, there, you know, there's a copyright issue. I'm sure people have thought about this because we live in a difficult era. Hey, here's Glenn showing peanuts cartoons. Isn't Glenn going to get arrested by the copyright police? And of course not, because I'm using this for educational purposes and for critical purposes. Uh, I'm not using it for reproduction. It doesn't re reduce the value of the original and it's not, you know, per se commercial. There's a very tiny element, um, but nothing direct. I'm not selling these or making prints from them. If I cast these Peanuts comics, uh, the flongs into plates and then printed them, well, that would be a whole other thing. I think the Schultz estate and uh, Universal uh, United Press Syndicate, you whatever it is, I'm sorry, I should know their name by now. Um, they would probably have real issues with me and, and could sue me for copyright violation. But, um, you know, I can take pictures of this and show it. This is for um, societal good and so forth. So you'll see me posting things like that. Uh, there's an article I wrote called Fl Flong Time, No C, sorry for the pun. That's at Medium. And there's a link in the notes for this video. You can just click to go there, um, you can find I've uh, one of the things I worked on for the last uh, few years is the Tiny Type Museum, and uh, this was all they're all sold out now. I made a hundred something collections, but you can see pictures of this online. Uh, it's genuine type artifacts, and uh, in the process of researching this museum and collecting uh, items for these these sets, um, one of the things that I found, of course, was long. And stereotypes. Here's a set I got for myself. Let's see if it'll show up right. This is from a newspaper column. For some reason, uh, I was able to find stereotypes made that were reproduced for a newspaper column. I don't know why I have these. I don't know where they came from, but I found the columnist. It was a syndicated columnist, and he actually drew these. He was an artist and a syndicated columnist. Um, so there's a lot of interesting material out there. Uh, somebody asked me on Twitter before we started on this event last yesterday, said, how can you find, oh, I should also, I'm going to promote my book, uh, Six Centuries of Type and Printing. Oops, blah, Six Centuries of Type and Printing. Let's see if we can get it in focus. Focus. There we go, sort of. It's tricky to get focus. Um, this is a book about the history of printing across, uh, you know, six centuries, obviously, and um, about the from a technology focus, letterpress printed, uh, set in monotype, hot metal, uh, bound in Germany. It's an exciting book, typeset in England, printed in England. Um, so anyway, someone said, how do I find these kinds of materials? If I'm interested, where do I go and find comic slongs? And I'll tell you, I'll tell you I've just been haunting eBay. Um, occasionally, you'll find things on Etsy. Uh, occasionally, people will post things in uh, other places, um, there's other sites like Briar Press is a site for letterpress people. Sometimes people will find things and post there that they want to sell them. They don't know what to do with them. Uh, there's some people I know who collect and resell type materials. Uh, if you're actually, if you're deeply interested in uh, uh, getting in touch with people who collect and sell letterpress materials, and that sometimes includes oddball stuff like flong and stereotypes, um, there's a fellow named Larry Leonetti who is invaluable help when I was doing the uh, type museums because uh, he found a lot of interesting little kinds of artifacts people don't care about as much. And that included some stereotypes and flongs, great stuff from him, but he's not, he, he sells stuff on eBay from time to time, but can be reached directly. Uh, there's a couple people in the UK right now, they're having a heck of a time shipping and selling to the U S so they don't do that anymore, I think. Um, but if you're overseas, you can contact and get you in touch with them. Uh, mostly letterpress like wood type. Um, there is apparently a hundred million uh, cases full of wood type all over England in barns that they keep finding. Um, it's, I think the US, I think we cleared out and threw things away more quickly or stuff is moldering in warehouses in the Midwest and, and uh, other areas, rural areas that nobody knows is there. But in England, it's just in everybody's shed and every shop seems to have a supply. Uh, but so eBay has been my best source. And in fact, thank you again to, um, boy, I feel terrible. I don't have the fellow's name. I'm going to look it up while we're talking. I want to thank him by name, uh, the uh, person who, uh, who uh, found all these peanuts flongs at the thrift store. And then I bought one set from him on eBay. And uh, he told me later, um, you know, I've got this whole set of things. Would you uh, be interested in the whole set? And I said, absolutely. Um, totally 
excited to get a, a full set of them. Oh, Michael uh, Leek, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, L-Y-C-K. Thank you, Michael. And um, uh, very kind of him to uh, make that offer to me. Um, and uh, I took these off his hand, a big box of stuff. And um, I'll be photographing it, as they say, in trying to distribute it. I'm not, at this point, I don't really want to, um, as I told Michael, um, Mikhail, I don't want to, uh, my goal in all this is, uh, you know, I, I can show you in my basement. I don't have a lot of storage space. My goal is to document and um, understand it, write about it, and then kind of disseminate it out to places where it'll be permanently preserved. So I'll be talking to some museums that I know interested in both comics and printing history to see if they want some of these. Um, would love to make sure that uh, these are in places where, uh, you know, they can be in private collections, but it's great to have them in public collections for study and preservation. Um, you know, I may be able to recoup my expense on buying these. Um, that would be great, but I'm not looking to uh, to somehow, you know, sell a thousand dollars for one peanuts vlog seems um, both uh, far too high and also unreasonable. So um, I'm not going to make these available for general sale until I talk to museums. And even then, um, I'll probably be talking to people individually. Uh, so yeah, so haunt eBay, eBay has a way you can do searches and then save the searches. I get email every morning that I go through for a bunch of different searches on type related stuff I'm interested in. And every couple of weeks I get some kind of gem and people, you know, a lot of this stuff is, is what's the difference between, uh, invaluable and valueless. And, um, uh, when is something priceless when you can't put a price on it because nobody wants to buy it. So some of this material, I mean, I feel like I'm Mr. Flong, I've cornered the market on it. When I've set the price for some things, um, so but you can often buy flying for tens of dollars, sometimes less. Um, some really interesting examples I've sometimes spent more on, like full pages of newspapers. Partly, it's uh, you know an amazing thing to find them and then for them to be shipped carefully. Um, I got a lead, uh, a friend on Twitter, a colleague on Twitter said, hey, I was just in Tacoma at this uh, antique shop. Uh, this is a few months ago. And they had a whole bunch of flying there. I bought it. I remember what you said about flying. I bought some flying myself. They still have some. So I went down there the next weekend and searched through it and found a bunch of great Seattle Post Intelligencer flying spanning decades. They had bought it again from an estate sale. Maybe someone had uh, worked at uh, the Seattle PI uh, years ago and did take it home out of interest. Um, and uh, so I bought several really high quality examples there, including this, uh, this page come from the PI. This is from, uh, yeah, yeah, this is the PI. So this is where I got this comics flung, this full page, you know, a little damage, but this was also was supposed to be printed from. I don't think it was because it doesn't have the marks of it, but it was built up with felt on the back. Um, so I just keep my ears and eyes open. Um, you know, there's not, there, I, I thought when I started down this, process of researching flong and getting into this niche area that because people don't pay you know something as i say people don't pay attention to because it's not very interesting unless you have a really particular um focus right and i kind of want to tell the story because nobody has and i think it's the kind of thing that's forgotten um it's huge industrial artistic production news process that that was left behind so um I thought there just wasn't very much of it. I thought there might be hundreds of, I don't know, I mean, hundreds of pieces of flong, but very little. I'd never seen any. Um, I, when I visited uh, the type archive, this is a story. Sometimes, you know, things uh, uh, bounce around in your head and later you realize what was said. I visited the type archive in London, uh, incredible resource that preserves the history of English typecasting and wood type manufacture from monotype uh, Stevenson, uh, um, Blake in Sheffield and uh, the uh, the little wood type manufacturing uh, family and company, um, they have all the almost all the assets that were used to create those three major for those three major traditions. Some things dating back to the I think the 1500s, and um, uh, I was led around there by uh, by its uh, founder and the leading light Sue Shaw, who is unfortunately uh, passed away in. Um, Gosh, it must have been mid 2021 in her 80s. And Sue, at some point, we we're looking, we we're talking around, walking around, and she's talking about something. And she said, "Well, you know, they burned all the flong." And I didn't know what she meant at the time. It kind of rattled around in my head. I, I had already seen an example at the Saint Bride Printing Library uh, not long before that, on the, the day before, uh, where I got in a tour. Uh, Bob Richardson had toured me, toured me around that amazing collection. Another huge, incredible collection of uh, typographic uh, history um, dating back again also to 1500s in some aspects and with uh, Gill's uh, drawings, Eric Gill's drawings and enormous amount of incredible material. And uh, I didn't even, no one even mentioned it to me, but I took pictures and realized later down in their, their uh, uh, letterpress printing office that they'd set up for teaching at the St. Bride, um, there were two enormous 
uh, stereotypes from the, the last metal day, last day that the Financial Times printed metal. These were two plates, these huge plates like I showed you earlier. But I'll heft it again in case you missed it. Let's see. Oh, I don't think I actually, I'm sorry. I feel like I can't, I cannot get it, the, the uh, plate up. It's all the way on the ground. Anyway, so um, uh, there were two giant hemispherical plates and, uh, uh, and also some flongs. I didn't know what they were. So I took pictures and later I'm researching and I go, wait, and I, and I find out about flong. This became my favorite word of 2017 as I'm researching. And I say, uh, wait a minute, I think I've seen this before. I go through my photos like, wait, that's there. And like, oh, that's what Sue was talking about. And what she meant is there wasn't very much flong created because why would you keep it? You'd burn it when you were done with it and sell it. And that's what people, I mean, not sell it. You'd, you'd burn it because there was no value in selling it. Nobody wanted it. It's an industrial process. The stereotype plates made of this lead alloy just like with lead type um, that was cast uh, from hot metal machines, it was remelted, the impurities removed and used again because um, New York Times would go through tons and tons of lead uh, every week, but it was all you know essentially recycled back into production. So anyhow, I thought, well, there's not much flying left because most of it was destroyed. Then I start to find weird things like people, are, you know, I find these stories, somebody on Reddit, it's like, you know, I rented this house once and the entire interior of the attic was coated in this weird paper mold. I think it's flung. And I find a story, uh, a Spokane, Washington news uh, station. You can still find it uh, archived a few places. I think they called it flung time, no C2 or something like that. And um, they have a story where somebody, they're pulling the, the, uh, clabbers off their house the side uh, the shingles and they find flong underneath they don't know what it is they call the history museum like oh it's somebody must have worked at the newspaper it's great insulating material it's wood pulp right uh and then i'm on ebay and i'm like well i'll buy what i can all these weird ads i'll buy some of this stuff because i won't be able to see it again and then over time people are selling maybe because i'm buying flong and a few other people i know are i see more and more flong and so i have a, a three uh, large uh, museum boxes full of uh newspapers from I think the oldest, like I say, is 1919, 1920, something like that, through uh, the 1970s. Um, I've got these examples of comics flung now a huge amount more with this Peanuts collection. And uh, my point is just to sort of collect a lot of examples, photograph them, and then you know keep some stuff for study, but then get it to institutions. But I, I'm guessing there's hundreds of thousands of flongs, maybe millions, still out there. And uh, the kind of stuff you can get includes you know this comic stuff is really interesting because it's comics you get to see you know directly into the process and so forth the newspaper stuff is interesting historically because newspapers often produced multiple editions sometimes up to 10 editions a day so it's sometimes interesting to see the front page of a newspaper maybe that copy was never actually um a copy of that edition was stored and, and uh, archived. So when you go onto newspaper uh, digitization sites, they will typically have, but not always, just one edition, uh, one front cover and one edition of the day. They're not uh, scanning 10 different editions or 10 covers. So um, there's aspects of that that are interesting, but you can also find there's tons of advertising flong. Uh, there's movie advertising. Oh, if I move my, let's see if I can, let's see if I can uh, get an image here. I don't know if I can, let's see. I will swap over to the other camera. I'll show you something. There's a, if you go to New York City, go to Manhattan. And what you will find there is the Alamo Draft House is, let's see if I can, can I zoom in? I can't. See that poster at the bottom? It's a little hard to see. Um, that is a uh, thank you from them because I helped them with some flying consulting. Uh, how exciting. Uh, it was, uh, they have a place called the Press Room. Oop, there we go. Uh, they had acquired the uh, Alamo Draft House acquired this enormous collection of uh, printing blocks by an outfit that made uh, all the movie advertisement uh, metal plates that were then produced for or sent out to newspapers. So an ad agency would produce, you know, many different sizes of ads that would go into a newspaper um, and then they would have to get that produced into flong format. So there's a place in the Midwest that did this and they kept their proof blocks for everything they did so they have i think it's sixty thousand. and when the place shut down the stuff got kind of sold around went to a thrift shop again a couple who were antique sales people or antique buyers went in there and bought the whole thing because they didn't want it to go to waste and then they eventually were able to work a deal with the alamo a few years ago alamo draft house and sell the entire collection of them and it includes a number of flongs but i think again like sixty thousand. um so it's the press room nyc and you go and visit and they have a whole bar that's they've got the blocks many of the blocks behind glass they have flongs. Uh, there are labels explaining the whole thing. And I did a pass of editing and uh, 
other stuff on that. So you may see my hand a little bit in, in the uh, museum labels that explain the process of uh, making flongs and stereotypes. And you can they actually have a printer on staff. So a person can make you, uh, can take down blocks and print stuff for you if you're there at the right time. So they sent me a very nice poster of all of, uh, they're all Elvis posters. Um, but so you can find movie flong out there and movie blocks sometimes. Um, and then there's clip art flong. You can see pictures of that if you go to my Flickr album, uh, where newspapers every month, they would get a set of sort of generic clip art that they would use to fill in empty space uh, in the metal days because they didn't want to create the art in-house. You know, story's short, they need to fill some thing. They want a banner, a holiday banner, and they don't have an in-house artist. So they would use this clip art flong, just like you could later buy it in books or buy it. It's, you know, services would offer it by Photostat later. Uh, so um, all that's out there in great abundance. I mean, I've, I've seen pictures. Some people have shown me a photo and they'll be like, oh yeah, that's all flong. And it's like, you know, floor to ceiling, it might be 20,000 pieces of clip art flong. So is that valuable to anybody? I don't know. I mean, some people, I think I saw there's a piece of flong up that's like $1,500 right now on eBay, maybe. And I've seen a stereotype. Someone was trying to offer the stereotype from the uh, Dallas Morning News um, the day that Kennedy was shot for the uh, uh, the uh, front page. And I think they wanted $20,000. And I'm like, well, you know, it's not... It is an artifact. It's from that time. It's a real thing. It was made then. It was used to print the paper. But how much do people care about that, right? Is that worth that much? So, um, you know, you can, and I negotiate sometimes with folks. I don't want to lowball them on anything. But, um, you know, there's a value that I think is worth it to me. And there's a value of preserving historically. I want to buy it in order to make sure that it's preserved and uh, give someone a fair value for what they have. That's a long explanation. Uh, Kim asked, uh, you'd be okay casting plates and showing the process of printing a final page for education purposes or education, I suppose, as long as you don't sell the result. Uh, I think that's right. I mean, that would get into, I would probably consult a copyright lawyer at that point. I could certainly um, do everything up until I sold the actual item that was copyrighted, I think, I think pretty fairly. I mean, this is not a legal opinion, but um, anything that I'm doing where I'm like, well, here, you know, here's this peanuts plate and you know, I can show this. Absolutely, this is educational. Hey, I'm not selling this, I'm showing it to you explaining it. It's got a very specific um, uh, cultural and educational purpose. And then I could cast it. Then I could show you me casting it. I could show you me printing it. I could make a thousand prints of it. And then if I sold them, then I think we cross the line is my suspicion because then I'm making commercial gain off something. Uh, I'm it's something that the value that accrued, like it does not have an educational purpose per se. Uh, if I wanted to print a book, that contained original prints made from plates made from these flongs. And the book was, um, again, like critical and educational in nature. I'm sure that's defensible. But, you know, this is Charles Schultz and, and some of these other syndicates, uh, you know, Gary Trudeau. Like, I would go and get permission and then see if Gary Trudeau would write the foreword, you know, that kind of thing. I don't think I would just go and do it and assume that I could rely on fair use. Um, and then you get the, you want to get the support of the institution too. So you go to the Schultz uh, estate or foundation and, and so forth. But um, I think there's a lot of stuff that's actually advantage. Um, I've got a piece. I can't reach it from where my arms are not 20 feet long. Uh, I bought a, a Bambi a block, a metal block. And um, I was thinking, I looked at it and I thought there's a problem here because it was created in the 1950s, this block. It has a C, uh, W, D, C on it. So copyright in a circle, Walt Disney Corporation. But at the time, that's not copyrightable. Uh, you had to have, if that image is copyrightable, it has to have the full copyright, it has to have the year and the creator. That's not really proper notice. There's no year. So that block um, arguably is in the technical domain. So I should be able to make images from it and sell it. I don't know that I want to go up against Disney. Um, one of the issues that came up with Alamo Draft House is they are convinced, they've written about it in a few different places, that, be, that um, the movie advertisement material that was sent to newspapers was specifically not marked as copyrighted because it would have been a whole deal for the ad, ad agencies and studios to provide copyright. So what they did is they sent stuff out that was not marked copyright. And by extension, that material is effectively in the public domain because it was never copyrighted. So Alamo Drafthouse can make these prints and do other things with these movie posters, movie, movie art. They can't make new posters. Like they couldn't um, take a movie poster that was printed by a studio and reproduce it because that always has a copyright notice at the bottom, but this stuff does not. So they recombine it and do things with it. And I, I accept that argument as a non-lawyer that they are absolutely um, acting within the 
constraints of, of public domain uh, use of work that isn't properly copyrighted at the time it was created. Now, since 1978, uh, that's a whole different matter uh, because copyright, uh, I think it's 78, that's when that starts as we harmonize with the world and then copyright is inherent with the act of creation essentially. So that's a different kettle of fish. Uh, but for this older material, um, you know, reproduction and use, um, you know, again, I'll note that these, uh, these plates, uh, they have, um, as opposed to the advertising plates, if I zoom up there, oh, I love this camera. So I'm using an iPhone here. Uh, you can see that's registered patent office, uh, all rights reserved, copyright, et cetera. This is a proper copyright notice. And thus, uh, I could not make any case that reproducing this material fell into the public domain. It's also 1978, but that's another issue. Um, I have gone much longer than intended. I hope everybody found aspects of this interesting and um, appreciate everybody watching live. And afterwards, again, you can find me at glenn.fun, G-L-E-N-N dot fun. That'll redirect you to uh, my website. You can find my blog and books. I have a variety of material for sale uh, related to printing. Um, books I've printed uh, by hand, uh, material, uh, my Sixth Centuries book, which was printed by other people uh, that I designed and, and uh, sourced the art for and uh, uh, supervised the production of um, that and wrote. Uh, the Tiny Type Museum is sold out, but I may have some more news on that in the future. And uh, looking forward to any other questions you have, post them in the comments. Uh, you can find my email address at the glenn.fun uh, URL. And um, I guess that's it for now. Thank you so much for joining me. And thank you for uh, your interest in Flong. Uh, hope to see some or all of you in some future Flong's place. Goodbye.